sales and operations planning is a very important topic but it is learned more by doing than by listening so we're going to have a lecture a short lecture Okay, so let's get started. Okay, <clears throat> now most of us, um, you know, we live in a world where capacity is limited, it's not limitless, lead times are non zero, and it takes time to produce and deliver goods, right? If that was not the case, then you wouldn't really need to plan. The reason we need to plan is because of these reasons, right? And so because almost always we need to plan, uh, we're going to look at this sales and operations planning uh, process or analysis, which a lot of companies do periodically. Okay? So because capacity is limited, lead times are non-zero, um, we have to plan in anticipation of demand on how we're going to meet demand. So whenever companies have a forecast and they update the forecast, they want to have a plan on how will they meet this forecasted demand. Okay. That plan is basically <coughs> called sales and um, operations planning. Okay. Sales and operations planning is called medium-term planning. So short-term planning would be next month, next few days, next few weeks. Long-term planning would be five years, ten years. Medium-term means about three to eighteen months. Okay? The most common time frame companies use is about a year. So planning for the next twelve months. It could be as low as six months, could be as much as eighteen months. Okay? The goal is obviously to maximize profit and what we're interested in is figuring out Okay, how much capacity do we need? How many workers do we need? Do we need to subcontract or not? How do we maintain our inventory levels to meet the forecasted demand? Okay. Basically, all of these things that we try to plan for are resources at our disposal. So we have to meet this demand. We have some resources at our disposal. Okay, what level of the resources we need at what time? Uh, and how do we marshal these resources to meet the demand is the key question we are trying to answer. Okay. Now, um, some of you might have heard from an operations course, uh, although I don't think we covered this topic that much in OM371, uh, the old name for this activity was called aggregate planning. Okay? Um, aggregate planning was basically looking at the demand forecast and saying, how much inventory do I need, how many workers do I need, how much capacity do I need, do I need to outsource production or not to meet that forecasted demand. After a while, companies realized that just focusing on managing resources is not sufficient. Let's say your sales are going low and marketing decides to run a huge promotion and because of that promotion, your sales start to spike up. So because when you were doing resource planning, you didn't have that information, uh, your plans may fall short. So you have to incorporate the sales and marketing aspects into your plan and not just do resource management but also talk, uh, think about demand management. When you incorporate the sales and marketing aspect into your plan, then you get a sales and operations plan versus an aggregate plan. They look kind of similar except you're f working with more variables here uh, to do with demand and here you're just working with you know, resource related variables. Together, you're able to match demand with supply at the lowest cost possible, which is the goal of supply chain management. There's been research that shows that uh, the success of the SNOP process is highly correlated with organizational success. So companies that do well at this process tend to do better than their competitors. This is a collaborative process where you're going to have people 
from different function areas come together. Uh, why? Because demand management, you need to be able to talk to your marketing people, salespeople, and for the resources, you need to be able to talk to production, operations, finance, and so often, uh, you know, managers from different functions are involved in making an SNOP plan. Uh, in the supply chain setting, uh, sometimes we have to extend to our customers and suppliers as well. Because if you have a sales and operations plan which ramps up production in a certain month and your suppliers don't know that, they may not be able to supply you with the critical parts because their plan doesn't have the ramp up, right? So you have to share the plan upstream uh, as well as you have to get information from downstream so you know when uh, promotions are going to happen and so forth. Okay, <clears throat> now we've talked about variability a lot, how a portion, how some part of demand we can predict, some part of demand we cannot predict, right? There's always some unpredictable demand. For our SNOP plan, we have kind of like two ways uh, to deal with variability. Okay, so let's look at the total variability and then split into two areas. One would be predictable variability, so you can predict, you know, if you sell uh, chocolate, candies, toys, you'll predict that your sales are going to spike up in November, December, okay? Uh, so there is variability in sales, but it's predictable, you know that the sales kind of go up in these months, okay? And then this unpredictable part, you may expect them to go up by 80%, but they go up by 90%, so there's some unpredictable part to that as well, okay? For predictable variability, we have to have a plan that deals with that demand changes. And for unpredictable variability, we need to have some buffers in place. So we'll talk about unpredictable at the end, uh, but for the predictable part, uh, you know, your forecast needs to predict that as much as possible, and then you have to incorporate that in your plans. Okay. Okay, so let's look at these two parts of the process. First, we're going to look at the orange part, which is demand management. Slides are color-coded, so you see a slide with an orange header. Let's talk about this part. Then we're going to talk about resource management. Again, slides are color-coded. See a slide with a blue banner. Let's talk about this part, okay? So let's talk about demand management. <clears throat> um, one, the first thing you want to understand is the effect of promotions. When we run a promotion, our sales can either grow and or its uh, sales can move in time, okay? So one way sales can grow is customers upgrade when things are on sale. I wanted to buy the, I don't know, the cheaper version of an iPhone, the expensive version goes on sale, the upgrade doesn't cost as much, I upgrade to the more expensive version, right? So there's some demand shifting to the products which are on promotion. Uh, so there, th for those products, the demand goes up. But if you have similar, you know, products on a, a f uh, which are lower end, that demand might go down, right? So this is demand for some product families goes up, some goes down. Total demand might stay the same. Um, Another type of growth that can happen is customers switch between companies, so you get market share from competitors, which is completely new demand for you, right? So this demand did not exist for you before. Somebody who's gonna buy the competitor's product now buys your product, yeah? Also, when uh, your price falls, some customers who were kind of on the threshold, buy or not buy, they might jump the gun and buy the product who were not gonna buy any product before. So you could have a sales growth in that sense. Then you could have sales move in time. Customers could forward buy. Somebody wants something down the road, but because it's on promotion, they're gonna buy it now. This is actually an important part because it doesn't change your total demand for the year, but this can help you move demand to make it more flatter. You can move the peaks a little bit here and there uh, to forward buying. So depending on what is the effect of the promotion, that influences when you place the promotion, right? Um, if your promotion is mostly gonna create forward buying, right, then you're gonna offer the promotion in the low sales season because you want some of the demand from the peak season to move earlier in time, okay? Any example of a product where promotions mostly just do forward buying, lead to forward buying? 
So a product where you drop the price, people don't consume more, they consume the same amount, but they just forward buy for future. Toilet paper? Sorry? Yeah, like paper towels, toilet paper, maybe laundry detergent, things like that, right? You're not going to start putting in more laundry detergent in your clothes or washing machine just because on sale. You probably consume the same amount, but just forward buy, right? Um, if you are increasing market share or growing your demand, then you kind of have to be more careful on where you put the promotion. Okay? If you put the promotion um, in the low season, a lot of customers uh, may not be looking out to buy that product, and you may not get as much of a boost in sales as you might expect if the product is seasonal. If it's not seasonal, then it may not matter, right? Um, so for example, you know, winter jackets go on sale in summer. If people are not paying attention, it's not on the radar, you know, you might sell some winter jackets in summer, but you might not sell a whole lot, okay? Um, so if, you are, if your promotion is growing sales, not just moving sales, then it's more uh, likely you're going to offer it in the peak season to get the most uh, number of new customers, to capture the most number of new customers. However, there's a disadvantage to doing promotions in the peak season. They'll make your peak even bigger to increase your variability, right? And so you have to figure out, okay, what is the cost increase by making my sales more variable or more peaky, all right, versus the benefit I get from the increased sales? How do you do this trade-off? If you make a sales and operations plan, you'll get some idea of how your cost will change uh, if your peak goes to be a bigger peak and you have more variability in sales. And then you can make that trade-off whether you should offer promotion in the peak season, before the peak season, after the peak season. Okay, so what are the factors that are going to affect the timing of the promotion? We covered the first one, you know, is it going to grow demand or just move demand? If, it, if it's mostly going to move demand, you usually do it before the peak season. Uh, cost of inventory. If inventory is very expensive, you're not going to be able to do a lot of forward buying by the retailers. Retailers will not forward buy. It's very expensive to hold inventory. Yeah? Um, also, because it's expensive to hold inventory, the manufacturer doesn't want to build a lot of inventory before the peak season. So usually, manufacturer will give promotions before the peak season so that they don't have to hold inventory and wait for the peak season. Then the third factor is the cost of capacity, how costly or uh, you know, less costly it is to move capacity up and down. Okay? If, you're, if your capacity is cheap, just if you remember the Crocs case, for them capacity was not very expensive because they use a simple process to make shoes. Uh, they could just move capacity, have a lot of capacity and not have, uh, and, and kind of chase the demand. Uh, but if capacity is expensive, right? then you would like to have sales to be more flat and less peaky uh, because then you don't have to change capacity as much. And then product margins. Um, higher product margins are you know, attractive in the sense that you can handle a lot of variable demand. Even if you have high cost of increasing capacity, the product pays back for itself. Low margin products, it's, high, uh, it's uh, less likely you're going to be messing up with your capacity too much because if capacity is expensive, you have low margin product, they will not compensate for the higher cost of changing capacity. Okay, so based on these factors, uh, you will do two things. First, you'll have a forecast, just like a basic forecast, what you say is going to look like. And then you'll decide when to do your promotions looking at all of these factors. Once you decide when to do your promotions, you'll change your forecast, right? Because if your forecast initial was whatever it was, and if you decide to do a promotion a particular month, you're probably going to have to change your forecast. Yeah? The change in forecast will be of two types. One would be how much do sales go up in promotion? So you'll increase the forecast for certain months, right? But if, you're, if you have forward buying going on, you also have to reduce the sales of the months following the promotion. So if you put a sale on toilet paper and you increase your forecast for one month, you have to reduce the forecast for the next month because people forward buy and they're not going to buy the next month. Okay. Okay. So 
if there if this pic if this was not part of the picture you would do this activity just to maximize your revenues right because you wouldn't see the impact on the cost of production of moving sales here and there and doing your promotions but we have to tie this in and now figure out whatever sales pattern we get with our promotions with our forecast what's the cost of meeting that demand using our resources okay if that cost is too high we may go back and then move our promotions to some other time period to flatten the sales out if this cost gets too high right so it's not that you do this first then you do that then you're done it's kind of iterative you do this with whatever idea you have then you do this part figure out the cost if the cost is too high it's not worth it to do promotions on those times then you go back change this plan then you get new cost here so you iterate back and forth okay okay so let's see what we can do on the supply side blue slides um the first lever we have is changing capacity changing capacity has two types of levers we usually talk about the one is uh, easier which is to just change capacity by having people work longer run machines longer if you work one shift in a day peak season you can run two shifts okay um if you have enough trained workers for example if nobody's doing overtime peak season you do overtime okay so that's just time based flexibility overtime extra shifts that can help you move your capacity somewhat There's obviously limits on that especially if you're already uh doing a lot of shifts. Okay? Another way to manage capacity is to use seasonal workforce like Amazon does. So right about now, October, November, December, there's going to be lots of temporary jobs at Amazon. Okay? Um you can go, get trained in a day or two or a few days and start working in the distribution centers, right? uh because amazon needs to increase the capacity of the distribution centers a lot of sales are going to happen in the last quarter of the year and then you can uh subcontract the production to uh, to some third party manufacturer so if you are making a product there are other companies who can make that product and put your brand on the thing then you can subcontract right so a lot of times companies will say okay we produce this much volume but when we are out of capacity we'll go to these subcontracting companies who will uh, our suppliers will send them the components they will assemble them and we'll get additional capacity and they'll put our label on it and everything you make it to our specifications um the fourth one is to have two types of facilities okay yeah. we saw this in crocs as well i know you guys might have forgotten that case so you may have um very efficient manufacturing facilities that work with very steady demand so they work at your average demand level and then when you have peaks you do the extra production on close by flexible production facilities which are more costly but they can quickly react to peaks and give you that extra production okay uh often this is done with suppliers as well companies will use two or three types of suppliers low cost suppliers with long lead times to handle predictable demand and then flexible suppliers with which are high cost but they they give you more flexibility and then another way to increase your capacity flexibility is to de- design a production process where you can either uh you know move volumes up or down easily or you can change the product mix so if the vo- uh, production requirements for one product goes up you can shift production um resources from other skus which are not selling as well to this product okay and another way which is actually also commonly used is to work in markets which have opposite seasonality so as most of you are probably aware northern hemisphere when it's summer southern hemisphere is winter when northern hemisphere has winter southern hemisphere has summer so australia and our seasons are opposite right so if you are a company which sells apparel right and you work on both hemispheres then your demand for winter apparel will be much smoother over the year sometimes you're selling in the northern hemisphere is winter here sometimes you're selling in the southern hemisphere is winter over there is winter somewhere in the world right a uh, same thing for summer apparel so you can um do that 
Uh, you can also choose products which have uh, opposite seasonality, summer products uh, and winter products. So your total uh, demand kind of remains stable. Now the last one here is not really, you're not really, you know, in, uh, having any capacity flexibility. You're not moving capacity up or down. It's mostly how you uh, decide which products to offer, which regions to work in, so that your total demand is kind of stable, or, although regional demand could be very variable. An easier way to get flexibility of supply is to just use inventories. Okay. Uh, build inventory before peaks if you can predict when the peaks are going to happen and then you have uh, you're able to meet the uh, variable demand easily when you have less demand you build up inventory when you have high demand you use up the inventory okay. now the good thing about variable capacity is that the more variable your capacity can be the less inventory you need to maintain right and if you are able, if you want to maintain a lot of inventory, then you don't need flexibility with capacity. So oftentimes companies will look at the cost, what's the cost of inventory versus the cost of extra capacity, and they may go towards one or the other or some combination of both. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so we are almost done with the, the theory part, and we'll get to actually making some plans. These are just some best practices in SNOP planning. I think we've hit most of them, uh, but let me point out the ones we've probably not. So you want to ensure that senior management uh, is involved in the process, backs the process, because otherwise you might come up with a plan for the next six months, 12 months, uh, and then somebody wants to change it, wants to produce less, more, change the promotion dates, and if senior management is not behind the plan, they will just do that and your plan is no good because nobody's following the plan. These plans are working documents. Usually what happens is at the end of every month, the forecast gets revised with new sales data. Whenever you revise the forecast, you want to go revise your SNOP plan because if the forecast change, you want to change how your resource planning looks like. Right? So every month the document is uh, revised, but because it's a, uh, be, at, you know that the revisions are not going to be that drastic for the next few months. People can still work off this document. As a retailer, you need to work with uh, upstream supply chain players to make sure they're aware of where the demand swings are going to come and the promotions are going to happen. Right? Um, and as a manufacturer, you also want to work with retailers to make sure that you can plan for those predictable demand variations. Okay, so let's get to actually building these plans. You need to first collect a lot of data before you can build a plan, right? You, you need to obviously have a forecast, and you need to know all of your costs. Because if you have the forecast, you have the cost, you can figure out the cost of meeting that demand forecast. Okay? Um, one thing I should point out though, which is, I guess, which makes doing this kind of feasible is we don't do this at the SKU level. We don't make an aggregate plan for every single product we sell. Okay? Uh, even though you know, if we have the time to do it, usually we're not going to do it. Okay? Why do you think that is so? Usually, let's say if you are a company which sells five, six different product families, each family may have you know 100 different SKUs of one type. So if you're a retailer shoes might be one category and then apparel might be another category and then home goods might be a third category so you'll do an aggregate plan for each product family not for a particular product one SKU right? what's the problem with trying, trying to do this sort of SNOP planning for one particular SKU Shane it's not nearly as accurate and right we talked about in the forecasting lesson forecasts are more accurate the higher up you go in the hierarchy. So for one SKU, they're very inaccurate. For a group of SKUs, a little bit more accurate. For a product family, more accurate. For the whole company, even more accurate. So if your forecast is very unreliable, making a plan based on that forecast is not going to be very useful because you're going to be way off. Right? So usually we do this at some middle level. Not the whole company, not the SKU, some level between the two. Yeah. Now, when we do make the plan, we get these sorts of output. We get 
when what promotions are we going to run and when we get how much production we're going to get out of regular workforce how much production out of overtime how much subcontracting to do we're going to get what the inventory is going to be in different months of the year uh, what the ba backlog or stockouts will be what are the workforce requirements how many people need to hire do we need to train how many people need to lay off and uh, any increase decrease in machine capacity now knowing all of this months in advance is very useful because if you find out you need 10 new workers trained for the next month's production it's going to be hard to hire them immediately train them immediately right so knowing all this in advance is very useful okay so let's uh, look at this example this is a company which has um, in a particular product family they have six products A to F okay each product has its own requirements right each product needs a different amount of materials and different materials uh, they have different prices they sell for uh, they have different setup times different batch sizes different production times right and then they have different uh, contributions to a total sales so the last column here if you see it will add up to a hundred percent because what's telling us for this product category product F contributes 15 percent to the sales right and the most popular product in this category is this one which contributes 25 percent to the sales now we need all of this cost data at the aggregate level right but the, here's the problem we want to do the plan at the aggregate level but all of the data exists at the SKU level all the cost data, all the time data is all at the SKU level. Okay? So the way around that is we make what's called a virtual product, which is an average of all of these products. It doesn't exist in real life, but we say, okay, this virtual product reflects what happens on average. And then we plan for this virtual product, and because if the sales mix does not change by much, our plan will hold. Okay, so you can have to trust that this sales mix will continue in the future. If we expect the sales mix to change drastically, maybe we're not going to offer this product next year, then we make this zero. If we're going to introduce a new product next year, we put that in, right? So the sales mix has to kind of reflect what's going to happen in the next few months. Once we have the sales mix down, we use this as weight to compute a weighted average of every column. So what's going to be the material cost of our virtual product? We look at this um, material cost, multiply $15 by 0.1 for 10%, plus 7 times 0.25, plus 9 times 0.2, and so on. We just take a weighted average, and you get some number here between 7 and 15, some number between the two, which will be the weighted average of the material costs. As long as your sales mix stays about the same, that cost is the right number to use for aggregate planning. Now, how do we figure out the labor requirements? How do we figure out the production time? Well, we know that each time you make 50 units of this product, you have eight hours of setup time, right? So per unit, you divide the eight hours by 50 to get a per unit setup time, and then you add the production time to get the total labor requirement per unit of this SKU. Again, once you have each SKU's labor content, something called labor content, how many minutes or labor hours go into one unit of a product? Once you have the labor content of each product, again take a weighted average with this column, you get the labor content of your virtual unit, or virtual product that you're making. Right? So that's what we do with all the family of SKUs within our product family that we're going to do the aggregate plan for. We just do weighted averages to say, okay, on average one unit of this family is going to cost this much in material cost, going to cost this much labor hours. Uh, is going to sell for this much and so you have all the data for the average unit which doesn't exist in real life is just a conceptual SKU does that make sense and then you can say okay you know I'm gonna sell 10,000 of this average unit so you can plan for that much sales what this allows us to do is that we don't have to look at individual SKU level forecasts which are very inaccurate. We look at the category forecast which is more accurate and then we can build our plan. Okay. Now you do want to make sure 
that when you make these families of SKUs, that these SKUs have similar production processes, right? You don't want to have a, a, a group where some products have a totally different process and totally different workforce requirements, different training requirements, and something else. Okay, so you don't want to look at, let's say you don't want to put together, maybe you're making the chassis for a car and you're also making sulfuric acid to put inside a battery. You don't want to put these two together because sulfuric acid is a very chemical process, batch process, reactions, making the chassis a totally different process. You don't want to club these two together because the requirements are so different that the average is not going to represent either of them very cl closely. So you want to pick products which are close enough so that the average can kind of represent them. Okay, so the good news is in this course you wouldn't have to go through this whole activity because you'll usually will just do it for one product or you'll be given this data anyway, right? But usually when people take this class and then they go out in real life, they say, I can't apply what I learned in class at all because now I have 200 SKUs under me and in class I just did one SKU. So what do I do? So this is basically what you do. You make groups of SKUs, find the average SKU for each group. Okay. Okay, um, now when you do make your resource strategy, you have kind of like a choice in what you're going to do. If your demand goes up and down, the first choice is you can use promotions to flatten the demand out, right? The, that's the demand side. On the supply side, you can meet fluctuations in demand with inventory. You can meet it by moving your capacity up or down. Right? And then you can also use some combination of backlog. You can say, okay, I'm not going to meet 10% of demand in the peak month. It's too expensive to meet that additional demand. So you can choose to let some demand go. Okay? That also happens sometimes. Like companies can say, we're not, we're gonna not just, we can't just meet that much demand. Okay? Okay. Um, there are some names for these strategies. Almost everybody does this. Okay? So, well, with some exceptions. We're going to talk towards the, actually next Thursday, uh, we're going to talk about which strategy is more appropriate with that case that we do. The chase strategy means we're just going to move our capacity up or down to meet variations in demand. A variation of this is to not move regular full-time employees up or down, not move equipment up or down, just move the time, overtime, extra shifts to move capacity up or down. The level strategy is we're going to keep our production generally level, just build up inventory in the slow selling months and use inventory to move the variations in demand. And then the hybrid strategy is to use all of these levers together, whatever gives us the lowest cost. Okay. Okay. So when do we use which one? Chase strategy, right? You're obviously going to use if capacity is easy to move and inventory is expensive. Sometimes you have products which uh, have very little shelf life. Okay? So for example, food products, right? uh, bakery products, cake, stuff like that. If their shelf life is little, you can't, you know, let's say a lot of people buy cakes on Christmas, you can't produce cakes in October and store them for December and inventory them. So you have to have some capacity going up or down. Right? Um, time flexible strategy is only uh, useful if you have the extra shifts over time available. Sometimes you are working at such a high level already that you don't have that available. Right? And level strategy is very useful uh, when you can use inventory. Uh, inventory is not expensive to maintain in, and there's not a shelf life issue with inventory. So you can just use inventory uh, to move. Uh, to meet customer demand fluctuations. Level strategy is also very useful for the workforce because workers get stable working conditions. They're working the same hours day in, day out, month in, month out. So they don't have very bad months or, or very idle months. It's kind of level for them. They're not new workers are not getting hired all the time and getting fired all the time. Right? In a change strategy, you may have a lot more changes in the workforce. Okay, and hybrid is just a combination of all of them. Okay, so Now let's talk about the last piece of the puzzle before we actually get to doing this stuff in an example. We have seasonality in sales. We accounted for that using demand management as well as our resources. But we are going to have some unpredictable changes in demand which you can't forecast, you can't predict. Okay? 
So often in an aggregate plan, companies will build in safety inventory and or safety capacity. How do you do that? For example, in your case um, that you have to do for next Thursday, the case suggests that they need to have certain amount of safety stock each quarter. So if your demand is a thousand, you're not going to produce a thousand, you're going to produce a thousand plus the safety stock requirement. You're going to overproduce to have some safety stock. Why? Because you can have unpredictable sales and then this will be used to meet those unpredictable sales. Okay. Another way companies might do this is say, okay, we have this much overtime available. In the aggregate plan or SNOP plan, we will only use half of the overtime. So if there are unpredictable sales, I have additional overtime remaining that I can quickly ramp that up and then meet the unpredictable demand. Right? If you leave no cushion, if you don't build any safety stock and you have no cushion in terms of overtime or extra shifts available, then um, you can be in trouble because there's going to be some unpredictable variation in demand that you can't deal with. Right? So you can build some cushion into your SNOP plan. Uh, you'll see here there are two Excel files. Okay? The first one is a template, just like we did a template for inventory. We, I'm giving you a template for this. But you do need to understand how to modify the template because no template can handle every situation that you might encounter. Uh, and so you need to know how this kind of template works. Okay? So here is all the data in the yellow cells that is data about our resources. So we have a, f a hiring cost. If you want to hire a worker, there's going to be some training cost, hiring cost, you put that up there. Okay? Uh, if you let a worker go, you might have to pay them some severance pay. That cost goes here. What is the wages? What are overtime wages? How many hours a worker has available in a month? Because this is by month. Um, in regular time goes here. How much overtime they can do in a month goes here. Uh, what is the labor content of one unit that goes here? How much labor hours go into producing one unit? Uh, if you outsource production, that goes here. Inventory cost per piece per month go here. Stock out costs go here. Maximum overtime available. This is just a function of this and the number of workers you have. Initial workforce you start off with goes here. Initial inventory goes here. Okay, and then you put your demand here. Okay, so. You have to take decisions in the green cells to come up with a plan to meet this demand. Okay? So you will decide each time period how many workers to hire, how many to lay off. These decisions will change this number. So if you hire one worker, you can see the number of workers went up. And if here you fire three workers, the number of workers would automatically just go down. So you decide how many to hire, how many to fire. Then you decide how much overtime to use. If you don't want to use overtime, you don't use overtime. Okay? And then you decide how much to subcontract. Based on how many workers you have, it will calculate how much production you can do because you've given it the labor content. right? And then based on how much production you do, how much you subcontract, and how much overtime you use, this is how much production is what will happen. Actually, this production is just overtime and regular workforce, and then you add the subcontract to it. Right? If your uh, production plus the subcontracting is more than the demand, you'll start building up inventory. Inventory will go up. If your production plus subcontract is less than the demand, look at time period four. A production plus subcontract is less than the demand, so the inventory we built up got used up. Inventory went down. Okay? And then if you're still short, it will show up in the back order cost. Okay. If you have other conditions, like you want to end at a certain level of inventory, you can type them here. This will not affect the table, but you have to adjust the variables to make sure that you end with that much inventory and you end with zero back orders. So the question might say, you should have no back orders, then you want to produce more. Maybe you want to hire more workers, maybe you want to subcontract, things like that. Okay. And then uh, your total cost will be calculated here, which is what you want to minimize. Okay. So this is just a very simple Excel sheet. There are basically just two formulas you need to be aware of. How does production happen? Production is a function of how many workers you have, and then you multiply that by the hours per worker, and then you divide by what is the labor content per piece, and that gives you how many pieces you can make. 
You want to make more pieces, either have more workers or more overtime hours. That's the only way to make more production. Okay? Now in this uh, Excel template, we're basically assuming that we have enough equipment. Equipment is not a problem. So I don't have a column for equipment. But you could just add a column, have another resource. Each resource gets their own column. So add a column, how many machines you have. And then your production will be a function of machines and workers. And then if you want to produce more, you have to increase the number of machines. Right? So basically you have three columns just like this. Machines to buy, machines to sell, number of machines you have. And then your production will be a function of machines and workers. The same logic. Right? Um, inventory is automatically calculated. How? You have things which increase your production, which add to your inventory. So regular production plus overtime production plus subcontracting. All these get added to inventory. And then your demand gets subtracted because that's how much you sell off, you ship out. So what's coming in minus what's going out equals your inventory that's left behind. Very simple formula. If you, if you put in this formula, sometimes the inventory value will be negative because you'll have less stuff coming in and more demand. Your demand is 3,800, you have only 2,500 coming in. Negative inventory, if you think like the root beer game, is what? Is a back order or a lost sale, right? So what I did here is my personal taste. You could just make it negative, is that I don't let inventory be negative, okay? The, by using this max function, if my inventory becomes negative, it picks a maximum, maximum of a negative number and zero. So what's bigger, zero or a negative number? Zero. So it'll put zero instead of making it negative. But then what the negative part was, I put it here as a positive number. So if I didn't do the max thing, this will be minus 366. But I made that zero and put 366 here to show that's the stock out. Okay? So you could do it either way. Okay? So you can play around with this. Um, now we can do something cooler here. What I can do is I can tell Excel to pick, make these decisions for me to minimize my total cost. Okay? Does anybody know any technique in Excel that I can do that? That will be really nice. Excel will do the work for me. How can I tell Excel to minimize this cost and pick the values for me so I don't have to decide what goes where? Sorry? Goal seek. Goal seek would work well if I have to change just one cell here. If I have just one decision cell and one output, I can tell Goal Seek, make this go down by moving this one cell. But Goal Seek doesn't work when you have so many decisions to make. Right? With a data table? Yeah. Data table is a two dimensional table. It can only work with at least, at most, two decision, two cells. There's no three, four dimensional data tables in Excel, so you could vary two inputs and look at the effect on cost and pick the minimum cost. No. Uh, that wouldn't work very well because let's say I want to minimize my labor cost and then I select this cell and it picks the work of minimize labor cost. Then I try to minimize inventory and that's going to drive the workforce up because if you're not producing inventory, you need to have excess capacity to meet the fluctuation in demand. Right? So if you minimize each piece, it will just, because you can minimize one cost and just drive other costs up. You can minimize inventory costs, have zero inventory, just have tons of excess capacity. Right? That doesn't mean your total cost is going down. So if you try to work on each piece individually because of the trade-offs, you will never get anywhere. You'll just move back and forth. Um, if then function is useful, max is like an if then function here. Here I'm doing if then, right? Uh, if inventory is negative, give me a zero, right? And if inventory is negative, you know, give me that number as a positive number here, kind of thing, right? Um, but it will up. Right, so you should all have taken a course on optimization called SCM 313. Anybody remember that course? Vague idea? Any idea? Okay. So, um, we can tell solver, if you have an objective function, something to minimize, maximize, and you have some constraints, you can use solver to maximize, minimize something subject to constraints. Do we have any constraints here? What are our constraints like? What could be constraints in this? If I tell solver to minimize this cost, it's going to say produce nothing, fire everybody, zero cost. Right? But the constraint is I have to meet demand. So that's my first constraint. Make sure I produce enough to meet demand. Okay? You could have other constraints. Let's say you never want to have a stock out. You could say never have a stock out and meet demand. 
Or you could have a constraint that says, okay, have a maximum stock out of 500. Don't want to have stock out more than that. You may want to end with non-zero inventory because maybe this is December, your factory is going to close down. So January for next year sales, you want to have some inventory in place. Okay, so maybe your constraint is okay. End with at least 500 pieces of inventory. So you can add all these sorts of constraints, but at least you can have a constraint that you want to meet demand. Okay, so uh, I've already set it up for you. So here, solver is set up where the constraints are only two uh, or three that I've put in. One is you must meet demand. Second constraint I've put in is you must not go beyond the maximum overtime available. Be, uh, with which you can control by changing this number. If each worker can do 20 hours of overtime, you put 20 here, this goes up, right? So there's maximum overtime constraint and there's a demand constraint. So you go to data, solver, everything is set up already. You hit solve and it kind of gives you what's the optimal kind of solution here, okay?